friendships come echo from the next center and I'm here with Dr. Suber and I would like you I would like to do a short interview with you. Mm -hmm. so sure. Hi Francisco. Can you introduce yourself and talk about your involvement in the open access community? Sure. No, I'm Peter Suber. I direct the Office for Scholarly Communication here at Harvard. I also direct a project at the Berkman Center called the Harvard Open Access Project. I've been working on open access full-time for more than 15 years. And before that, I was a professor of philosophy for 21 years. <coughs> oh. And I could have stayed, uh, but I quit because I wanted to work full-time on open access, and I couldn't do that inside my job as a professor. But I got interested in open access because I was a publishing scholar at the time the internet came along and the time the web came along. And I began to put my own works on my personal website, my previously published work on my website. And right away I started to get correspondence from colleagues uh, at a higher level and a higher quality than I'd ever gotten before from the print editions. In other words, people were actually reading it and taking it seriously and taking the time to write to me about it. And of course, that's why I published in the first place. I wanted to engage with my colleagues. I wanted to have some impact. And I realized I got this impact more from these online versions than I did from the original print versions. Mm -hmm. And this was early. This was in the <clears throat> mid-80s and late-80s. And I uh, looked around for examples of other scholars who were doing the same thing and who had noticed that the web is a serious platform for scholarship. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find too many people. but. Uh, I found a few, and every time I found somebody, I would correspond with them, and I would broadcast to other friends that somebody else was getting it. Uh, and eventually, I turned this into a newsletter in which I would notice examples of people using the web for serious scholarship. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote that newsletter for more than 10 years. Can you please identify an, an open education or an open access initiative or idea that you find really interesting? Yes, uh, the hard part is picking just one, but one that I'm very interested in these days is what I call a rights retention open access policy. Yeah. Uh, until 2008, all university open access policies simply said, we encourage you or require you to deposit a version of your latest scholarly article in the repository. But that was it. It was simply a deposit policy. Mm -hmm. And when the repository got hold of the file, it didn't have permission to distribute it. So they had to uh, count on publishers who gave this permission in advance, and there was a good number of those, or they had to go to the publisher and ask for permission, which was time-consuming, uh, labor-intensive, and often unavailing. Uh, it often failed to get the rights. A rights retention policy is one where the faculty say, we hereby give to the university non-exclusive rights to our own future articles, and we also commit to depositing our articles in the repository. But this way, when the repository gets the article, gets the file, it already has permission to deposit it, and it has permission from the copyright holder because it's coming from the author before the author grants any rights to the publisher. And if you set it up right, which is uh, an important if, if you set it up right, then the university has these rights regardless of what contract the author later signs with the publisher because the author previously granted non-exclusive rights to the institution, and that prior grant of rights takes priority over the subsequent contract. Uh, that's the kind of policy we have at Harvard, yeah. but I'm not just uh, praising it because we have that here. In fact, uh, <coughs> I can praise it because Harvard adopted it before I got here, and uh, I endorsed it at the time. Yeah. Uh, it's been adopted, this type of policy has been adopted by 80 universities around the world in North America, Europe, Africa and Asia, and it suits every type of university. It has to be fine-tuned a little bit for local copyright law uh, to make sure that you uh, that the prior grant of rights does supersede the subsequent contract. Uh, the rules about how to do that differ from country to country, but it can be done in just about any country. And it's much more beneficial than an ordinary deposit policy because it enables you to actually distribute the work, and it uh, eliminates all the labor and time required to seek permission. Would be cool if every university adopts that. Very cool, yeah. yeah. And by the way, we maintain a guide here at Harvard on how to do this, at least under U.S. copyright law, but yeah. the sections that are U.S. specific are very uh, brief. The rest of it would apply to any country anywhere. Uh, and any university that's thinking about such a policy uh, 
should just consult our guide. I'd be happy to share the URL with anybody. It's yeah. open access, of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, would you like to share with us some tips or recommendation uh, directed to some educators or decision makers in the MENA region for like facilitating the OER, some yeah, the adoption of OER? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. First, when I was a teacher, which started in 1982, before there was a, a web, uh, I always gave away my course materials to my students. <coughs> Technically, since 1978 in this country, they were copyrighted, whether I registered them or not. I didn't pay much attention to the copyright, but even though I was the copyright holder, I just freely gave them away. Teachers do this all the time. It's part of the nature of teaching. Uh, you don't write course handouts to keep to yourself. You write them to share with students. So I think all teachers have this disposition, this leaning, this, uh, this knowledge that it helps students, it helps them in their own role as teachers to give their work away. Now that there is a web, and they probably write their handouts and their exams uh, and their lectures digitally in the first place, they can share them online and not simply share printouts. So I would just remind teachers of the uh, sharing that is at the basis of all teaching. And when they make new course materials, they should automatically share them. In the early days when sharing teaching materials online was a fairly new idea, many teachers said, but somebody at another school might use it. And I said, yes, they might. And wouldn't that be a good thing? Uh, why is it good for your students to use it, but not for other students to use it? And the light bulb went on. Well, what if a teacher at another school used it? Uh, well, why not? Uh, if you're proud of it, if you think it's a good handout for this topic, wouldn't it be a good handout for them as well? Uh, it only becomes a problem for some teachers when somebody plagiarizes, that is, they use it with and pretend that they wrote it themselves. But plagiarism is already a crime in the academy. Uh, we don't have to make new rules against that. And when teachers used my handouts online at their own schools, they always did it with attribution. In fact, they always did it with thanks and appreciation. They said, well, thank you. Uh, after a, a time, I had a lot of experience in my own courses, and new teachers who didn't have a lot of experience in the same topics would use my handouts as a fast way to get started. Uh, and they were very grateful for that. I think all teachers should share with everybody, uh, and that means students will benefit, it means that other teachers will benefit, and if you care about this, it means you will benefit too because your name and your knowledge, your reputation for knowledge will also spread. There's no drawback whatsoever. Uh, it's not as if you could have sold these handouts through a publisher. Uh, nobody sells handouts through a publisher. It, it gets a little tricky when you're talking about a textbook that you could have sold through a publisher. Mm -hmm. It's also tricky because successful textbooks make a lot of money for their authors. But successful textbooks that make a lot of money are also very rare. Uh, and if you're the kind of person who could write one, I guess I could say, go ahead, write it, and make your money. On the other hand, most teachers are, who uh, are inclined to write textbooks are also inclined to share them, and they could well be persuaded to share them, and it wouldn't be hard to see that the benefits of sharing them outweigh the costs of holding them back and trying to uh, sell them through a publisher. It's also possible to do both, to share and sell at the same time, uh, to give away the digital edition and sell the print edition, and that's one way that open textbooks uh, maintain themselves. So I don't think teachers in the MENA region need any special encouragement for this. I think all teachers already share this inclination. They already see the value of doing it. Uh, I would just remind them, uh, remember your vocation as a teacher. Uh, you only help people if you share your knowledge, not if you keep it to yourself. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.